we're on uh, we're on pace here. We're on schedule, which is amazing. But uh, don't worry about the schedule, coach. We got most of these guys got all day and all night. So uh, I know you probably don't, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know these these uh, the, these meetings have been you know really informal, and you know this whole thing is just you know that the time's one thing, so it's structure. But uh, but we'll just we'll just keep rolling along. So Coach Rhodes, University of Arizona defensive coordinator. Uh, coach, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. You got it, Jim. Thanks for thanks for inviting myself and, and University of Arizona to participate in this. I, I know the offensive staff, uh, if, if not all of them, some of them have, have been on in the, in the last month. And Stan Agan, our, our defensive coach, was on yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm privileged to be on here today and, and, and talk a little football. Uh, I'm I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm close to zoomed out, but um, it, it's what it is. And, and uh, the opportunity to get on with you men and, and uh, talk a little football and, and, and answer questions throughout, uh, I'm, I'm excited to do. When, when I flip my screen here and, and, and uh, start talking off the, the clinic stuff, uh, please, please jump in. If you have a question, um, can't see a hand go up or, or eye contact or anything like that. So if you have a question, chime in and, and uh, we'll work hard to get it answered. I am a little bit IT challenged. I've been operating fairly well here at home, but uh, if, if, uh, if I stumble or falter, hopefully we can work through it and, and, and get it moving. Um, I, I just got here in the month of December, as, as uh, some of you are probably aware, uh, join Kevin and staff, and we have not met in person one time as as a defensive staff, which is uh, which is a little bit unusual. I did not think I would be installing a defense, both as a defensive staff and a defensive unit uh, via computer. Something I don't know how to use very well, but that's the way it is. That's our world, and and that's how we're operating. We're making. Uh, up steady ground as as we go. We we got four practices in before we went on spring break and, and everything shut down. So my talk today is going to be around defensive uh, fundamentals and and uh, going to going to do some defensive back stuff as well. I am coaching the inside linebackers here at Arizona, um, but there's not enough film material put together yet for for me to. Uh, expand and, and give what I feel would be a, a, a great clinic, clinic, a clinic worth your time. So I can do that with, with defensive back play where I have more than enough film, albeit that film might come from the University of Pittsburgh or Arkansas or UC, UCLA past stops of mine. It'll be film that I can teach and, and coach off of. Um, I am recruiting in the state of Arizona. I have uh, the Tucson area down here, and then I worked my way north to the east side of Phoenix. I recruited it while I was at uh, UCLA. I ran into Charlie uh, many times. Um, I assure you, when, when, when I was at UCLA, it was my primary area. Uh, as I was down here recruiting, and, and uh, I asked for it when I was there and, and asked for it when, when I arrived here in Tucson and I'm excited about recruiting the state, feel like we're making great uh, inroads um, to the university, and and I just can't wait for the, the the pandemic to end to get get kids and families and so forth back down here on campus to see what we have to offer. Let's let's uh, let's move into it. Uh, I'm going to try to do this. All right, we're doing that. We're sharing. My gut is it's not going to take the first time here, but we'll see it's what it's been doing to me. That's what I thought. All right, Jim, am I sharing? 
Yeah, we got you, Coach. Looks great. Thank you. Perfect. 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 Okay. I I, I want to talk a little bit, and, and I, I think I've got somewhat of a, a unique perspective. I've, I've had the opportunity to be a head football coach at this level for seven years. Uh, I've been a, a coordinator for, for over 10 years and in a position coach for the rest of the time. So I, I'm just going to mix in some philosophical things uh, based based from the, the bottom up or the top down, however you want to look at it. And, and one of those things, one of those things that I covered with our defensive unit uh, upon my arrival was, was about expectations. And a, a story was told to me years ago about uh, Barry Bonds and, and his return trip from a World Series loss. And he was with his wife at the time and, and he was dejected, his head was down and, and his wife finally asked him what he was so upset about. And she reminded him that their expectations were to get to the World Series. They never talked in terms of winning the World Series. They just talked about getting to the World Series. So the, the, the crux of this is set your expectations high because rarely do you exceed your expectations. And when we do, we're surprised. So upon arrival uh, at the University of Arizona, we, we talked about things as a defensive unit, such as bowl games and bowl wins and, and raising the standard of, of how we play defensive football. And that's, that's mind you, that's with the personnel that we have and, and uh, with, with, with all those cards that were dealt. But we want the expectations high. We want the kids to believe they can achieve in, in that regard. And I was very pleased with the direction we were moving as we got through four practices. Okay, mental toughness. Mental toughness is something I, I really, really – started emphasizing when I was at the, the University of Pittsburgh and we, we gave it a definition so it was concrete so the kids had something uh, that they could refer back to and then we've tweaked the definition as time has gone by. But mental toughness is the ability to prepare, practice, and play at a maximum level of concentration and effort under any circumstances in order to perform like a champion. So just to give you an idea uh, uh, of some changes, okay, added maximum level. Uh, just talked about a, a high level or something to that regard of concentration and effort. And then recently have added this one under any circumstances in order to perform like a champion. So if I go back to the top is the ability to prepare. And that's what, that's what you coaches are doing right now. That's, that's what I'm doing. That's what we're doing as staffs. That's what we're doing in our Zoom meetings with our, our position players. We're preparing. Uh, we're, we're, we're learning. We're, we're, we're working X's and O's. We're watching tape. We're studying technical things and so forth. We're preparing to play the game, okay? Practice. We, we only got four in, and, and we're certainly going to be limited on those numbers, and, and we're all limited on those numbers. But when we get the opportunity – to step on the field and, and in between the white lines that we're, we're practicing uh, as, as we prepare for those games that we play and then play at a maximum level. So prepare, practice, and play at a maximum level of concentration and effort. So we're talking about both focus and mental, and we're talking about the physical piece of it, the running around, the hitting, uh, the, the technical, the drills, the pedals, the punch and so forth under any circumstances. So we talk about the heat like we have here in Arizona. We talk about the humidity like they have in the Midwest and the South. We talk about the cold like they have in, in, in parts of the country. We talk about fatigue that occurs as you play the game and, and, and practice and so forth. So under any circumstances, we wanna keep preparing, practicing, and playing at a maximum level of concentration or focus and effort so we can perform like a champion. There's, there's a lot of concrete to that. And we emphasize that uh, on a daily basis. And you can emphasize it in the meeting room when somebody's drifting. You can uh, uh, emphasize it on the practice field when somebody's not giving full effort, and certainly on game day uh, when the rain starts coming or the snow starts coming or the temperature reads 100 plus degrees. Okay, all right, five phases 
of, of the plate. This, this, is how, this is how I install a defensive call. I install it this way with our unit. I install it this way with, with my position group, whatever position group that is that I'm working with. Again, now it's the inside linebackers. I want to give credit where credit is due. I got this from a gentleman by the name of Larry Hoyer, who is a, a retired football coach who's coached football at all levels. He was a head high school coach uh, back in Ohio uh, years and years ago. He went on to coach at the collegiate level and then made it to a Super Bowl uh, in, the, in the National Football League. I GA'd for him at Ohio State in 1991 and then worked underneath him at Iowa State for two seasons in 95 and 96 when he was the defensive coordinator. And then I replaced him at the University of Pittsburgh when he went to the New York Jets and I took over as the coordinator there. Um, so I, this is something I learned in 1991 and, and still utilize it today. Matter of fact, I utilize it in about every clinic talk I give because it is, it is that simple uh, yet, yet that powerful in, in the approach to slowing the game down for, for the players. So the first phase of, of, of a play is the call. The, the kids got to know and understand the call. I break that down into two pieces. Know the call. They got to see the signal. They got to hear what the defensive call is. Most of us, I think now, are, are signaling in to all 11 defensive bodies because of tempo and pace and no huddle and, and so forth. So they've got to know what the call is. They got to have their eyes on the appropriate person and they have to see what it is they're playing. We, we've all encountered that post-game meeting where we're talking to so-and-so and asking him, what were you doing here? What were you thinking here? And his response is, coach, I, I didn't know what the call was. Well, he, he can't play it. So the very first phase is you got to know what the call is. There's going to be circumstances where uh, a young man's shoes untied, he's down on the ground tying that shoe, or he's got mud and crap all over his face masks, and he's cleaning it off, and, and he misses the signal from the sideline. Well, there's 10 other guys out there in the field, and one of them is fairly close proximity to him, then ask, okay? Have him ask somebody out there in the field so he knows what his responsibility is and what it is he's playing. I'll add this to it. I try to teach our signalers that as they're signaling repeatedly, that they're finding the eye contact of all 11 bodies out there in the field. Once they see somebody's got it, they're moving on to the next guy, playing, paying very close attention to the far defensive backs, the far defensive players on the field that might be missing them. And they're prepared to move around a little bit if they can't see one of those players. So the very first phase is knowing the defense that, that you're playing. The second piece of that is to understand what that defense is. And I'll just take a call uh, in, in how we called it years ago and, and make sense of this. G3. G was, was our front. G spoke that we were putting our three technique to the tight end side of an offense. That's how we were aligning the front and the linebackers accordingly to the tight end side uh, what we called our rush end was going to align, our Sam linebacker was going to align, our strong safety was going to align. On the opposite of that, our, our end was going to align, our will was going to align, our free safety was going to align. Three, we were playing three deep coverage. We were going to roll down to passing strength. Whichever safety that was, he was the one that was going to come down in a sky position the two linebackers nearest him were going to be our hook curl players. The linebacker away from that sky call was going to be our curl flat player on the other side. The safety not to passing strength was going to be our post safety or our alley safety. The corners were both going to be true third players. They were going to be playing pure or true zone, as I referred to it, not matching up with the receiver. Uh, we had a four-man pass rush with, with the tight end. We had the ability to gain planet and either be a seven technique inside him or a nine technique. So understanding the call, having those things go through your mind as you see the signal come in, you get what it is, 
and then you're thinking about the operation of it and how it plays. The second phase of a play is to recognize the formation. So in that, that previous call I just gave you, G3, we had to know where the tight end was. You're, you're, you're recognizing the formation for, for two reasons, okay? And one of those is to, to identify tendencies and to eliminate guesswork in that process. So as I recognize the formation and I got four wide receivers on the field and I've got two on one side, and two on the other in a spread formation, I, I recognize from that that this particular offense that we're facing, we're going to get pass game. That's, that's what they're going to do to us. I recognize a pro I set that we're going to get run game. And, and not only are we going to get run game, we're probably going to get run game to the tight end. If we get pass game out of that pro I set, it's more than likely going to come off of play action. So these are things that I recognize in the formation to give me an idea what play is coming at us. Okay, the second piece of recognizing the formation is so we can align properly the third phase of a play. If, if I'm a third corner and I've got a receiver that's aligned to the field and he's aligned wide on the top of the numbers, I'm going to align myself inside to help protect, protect on, on a deep post. If I've got a receiver to the field playing cover three and he's aligned within three yards of the hash, I'm going to put myself outside that guy. He's nearer our post safety, and I want to play my deep third responsibility on the outside edge of the player in this case. So I'm recognizing the formation to get myself aligned properly in order to execute and do my job. The first three phases of a play I remind you and bring to your attention that the ball hasn't been snapped. So 60% of the play is taking place before the offense snaps the ball and begins to execute a block or a route. More offensive success is a result of poor defensive alignment than possibly anything else that, that, that could take place. So, uh, going into a game, going through a scouting report, and, and his players are, are, are better than your players, uh, you, you better give yourself every chance by making sure your kids are aligned right uh, on a consistent basis than executing the next piece. Keys. Run and pass keys. Everybody has their beliefs, and as an inside linebacker coach, there, there, there's two, two primary beliefs. One is, is to underkey, to key key the guards through the guards to the backfield or, or, or to key the triangle uh, and other people key the back and, and, and feel those underneath guys. So there's different sets of keys. and You have what you believe in. Just make sure it's getting emphasized and it's getting executed. And with the best way to do that is be in a coaching position where you can see your kids' eyes. So you know they are where they're supposed to be, where you want them to be, and they're reading their keys on a consistent basis. And the fifth phase of a play is then to execute, to do their job, to take care of the B gap, to cup the football, to set the edge, to take care of the deep third and stay on top of receivers as they work their way downfield. I'm, I'm not gonna go into to this with, with great detail. I just wanna point it out from a secondary perspective and set, uh, point it out from a linebacker perspective. I think it's important that you give your kids things like this that, that they can hang their hat on and they know these are their priorities as a position group. And if they execute these priorities, the defense, the whole unit has a chance for success. And, and th this, was, this has always been my back end piece. I say mine, this is another piece I got from Larry Coyer back in 1991 and I've used it with every secondary I've coached. And if these numbers uh, after, after game day has occurred come out as, as, as two or less uh, in, in how we played in the secondary, if you're putting those kinds of numbers up, you're, you're playing great defensive football. And that's just with the back four guys or five guys based on a nickel package. So as a secondary, we want to get the ball on the ground. We don't want to give up deep balls or, or X plays, big plays. And when I say deep balls here, I'm talking about run and pass. 
and and we had parameters for those. They've changed over the years as the offenses have developed and rules have changed to favor the offense. Um, but whatever those numbers are, 20-yard pass, 10-yard run, 25 for either of them, a quarter of, of, of the football field, uh, have it set up where, where it's realistic to your game and the kids uh, know what that number is that they got to eliminate. No coverage busts. Can't have one side of the ball playing thirds and the other side playing halves and, and, and voiding the zone. Uh, and then cup the ball. It's just my way of saying contain the football, keeping the ball inside and in front of you. As a linebacker coach, I operate with a big three instead of a, uh, the big four, and that is sure tackling, no mental busts, and then fit properly. If I should be taking it on with my left shoulder, I damn sure want to be doing that and not taking it on with my right shoulder and, and spilling it to nobody. If, if I'm working fast to the edge because of a fast flow play, I want to make sure I'm doing that and not getting stuck inside and letting the ball get on our perimeter. So these are the three things that we emphasize at the University of Arizona from an inside linebacker position room. Some secondary axioms that I believe in. Never take an inside fake. And never take an inside fake. So I'm back there as a quarter safety and, and, and the quarterback uh, has play action into the B gap. I'm not stepping up on that inside fake. I'm holding my depth to execute my responsibility. Play the ball, not the man, okay? We cover the receiver, we cover the man, but once I cover the man, then I wanna get my eyes back around and, and play the ball. I think we're all the victim of, of uh, broadcasters and commentators and, and they talk about uh, whether it be a linebacker or a secondary guy, how he read the quarterback's eyes the whole time. Uh, that's great on, on those plays where he, he got that interception, but they don't ever talk about the other percentage of plays where the guy's watching the quarterback's eyes and the receiver has worked his way away from him and they throw the ball and they complete it for a 15, 18, 25 yard gain down the field. If I am in a man coverage or if I'm in a, a progressive zone type of coverage where I'm responsible for a receiver that's working up the field, I want to see him. I want to cover him. Then I want to get my eyes back to the ball. Now, if I'm in a pure zone coverage, Cloud kick, kicking me out. If if I'm in a pure zone coverage, then then I am uh, uh, with eyes that are back on the quarterback because I'm playing a true area of the field. I'm not responsible for a man or a man within my zone. And in in getting that accomplished, you do get more eyes on the ball and you get more opportunities for, for turnovers and, and plays on the football. All right, uh, um, jump down here. That last axiom that we want to emphasize is, is a deep defender never breaks on the short arm action of a quarterback. So as a half safety, as a third corner, as a post safety, when, when, that, when that quarterback jerks that front arm and he drops that elbow down or he drops the shoulder, I'm not responding to that action. I'm responding to that front hand coming off of the football. That's what I'm responding to as a, as a deep defender as far as the passing game is concerned. Some things I think to be a great defensive back. Uh, it starts with a stance. And I talk about numbers over knees and knees over feet. Numbers over knees and knees over feet. When I'm at the side of a guy, that's what I want to see. I don't want, there's, there's only one Deion Sanders uh, uh, bending at the waist and having his numbers and shoulder pads way out over grass. Uh, that doesn't work very well for, for non-Hall of Famers. Uh, and, and I want to stand to the side and be able to draw a line that goes through their numbers, through their knees, and down to the feet. Okay, eyes, their eyes need to be in the proper location and, and they got to be able to backpedal. If they're going to be a great defensive back, 
they got to be able to backpedal. I think a lot of people now play with their hips open and cross over and run, but I think to be a great defensive back, you've got to be able to backpedal and stay square and work efficiently forward and backwards. Movement, movement, okay? We start with, with our backpedal and how we work that in practice is what we call a line pedal. All right, so I start practice again. This, this film is going to be from all over the place, but we're going to cover the techniques and the drills that we're talking about. This is just a line pedal. This is how we start individual drills when I coach the defensive backs. And, and there's a number of reasons for this. I want the muscles to wake up. So when we start the defensive back drills, we're going to go right into a pedal, and I want the muscles to say, okay, this is what I do as a defensive back. This is a position I got to get in. If, if we just concentrate on these first two guys, okay, the guy to the left, the guy upfield, okay, let me get back to this guy right here, he's in a great stance. He's in a great position as he moves. The numbers are over his knees, and the knees are over his feet, and he's snapping the pedal from his knees down, moving back. If we look to the guy that's down low, okay, you can see his chest forward. And, and if you just look at those two move, you can see the efficiency in the guy up top, okay? And, and what I believe is a lack of efficiency in the guy here at the bottom. He's going to, if he gets a curl or if he gets a dig, he's in good shape. His weight's forward, he's going to pull it a foot in the ground, he's going to go. But if his cushion gets ate up and he's got to open his hip up and throw his elbow and cover the post, he's not going to do that as, as well because of that body position, okay? This is a drill, I call it gizzard. Uh, from the first gentleman I, I, I worked for, a guy by the name of Fred Vile, who's, who's passed from cancer. But this is a drill, uh, 1989, when I knew, before I knew what a hip flexor was. Uh, um, it, it's, it's designed to stretch and strengthen the hip flexor muscles, muscles as a DB, that I'm using play after play after play as I, as I roll my hips open and put a foot in the ground and, and break out of it, especially during training camp or, or uh, all day seven on sevens and, and the players that end up with that ace bandage wrapped around their waist and, and, and their groin and so forth are, are because they, the, the hip flexors haven't been properly taken care of. So again, we'll focus on, on, the, on the first guy on this side, because he does a, a great job with it, we won't have to look at anybody else. I want that knee to go to the sky. So as he opens up, okay, the knee's going to the sky, the fallen leg is coming around, and we want the hips to roll, roll open all the way. We're going to just go both directions. So I'll take him back, and there he is starting out left and then right, and the leg is breaking off. So, see if I can't stop it. Okay, there, there's a look at it, okay? When I talk about the leg breaking off, that's what I want. I don't want the foot going up like this. I don't want it straight. I want the leg to break off. It's the knee I want to go to the, to the sky, and I want to swing that around. So, we'll just work down right and left, come back left and right. We're getting two swings with, with both legs. And we do this every single day that we're working out there physically. First thing they got to understand is, is this is not a technique. This is not a zone turn. This is not what you're going to do when you're covering a down the field route. This is simply a stretch and strengthening exercise for your hip flexors. All right, back pedal progression. There, there are four phases of it in, in, in my estimation. I'll give you a second to, to, to write it down, but then I want to uh, move forward to the video so you can see it and I can, I can coach off of that, okay? Control phase, okay? And this is a piece where some people play with their hips open and they slide or shuffle or, or, or whatever your term is for it, but it's, it's the first phase where I'm moving at a controlled rate of speed and I'm figuring out whether we got a run or we got a pass and what kind of pass is it? Is it a drop back pass? Is it an RPO pass? Is it a hot pass? What I refer to as the quick game is a hot pass. And my next level of speed is dictated by what I see in this control phase. The second phase of a back pedal is a true speed pedal. I'm going from the control movement to pedaling as fast as I can 
to help me secure the upfield shoulder as long as I can. And I'll talk about the components of the pedal as we get into it. The next phase is the zone turn. The receiver has ate up my cushion. A general rule of thumb would be three yards from me, but it varies based on who that DB is, okay? As a DB, my cushion was five yards because I was, I was very unathletic and, and needed to get my hips open sooner so I could run. I had the great fortune of coaching Darrell Rivas, and his cushion was about a yard. Uh, he could wait before the guy got into him before he had to get his hips open. I think it's important that you recognize that with your kids and coach them accordingly instead of purely black and white, that everybody's getting themselves open at three yards, but it's a good place to start until you discover what that is. If the route continues vertical and he eats up the rest of the cushion, then we want to make sure we're, we're completely now opening our hips up and turning and running fully with the receiver towards the goal line. Okay. I want to talk about fundamental pieces of it. I want to talk about efficient pieces of it as, as we go here. This, this is back in, in, in my pit days. All right. So here's the control phase. I'm simply telling them, uh, ready, ready. And then I'm starting with my hand movement there. I try to start as many defensive drills with movements rather than cadence. I want them to know we're getting ready to start with a cadence, but then I want the actual drill to start off a movement just like it does in a game. You see these guys both rolling into it, their butts drop and they slide back. I don't like that. That's poor coaching by me. I should have made sure they were in a great numbers over knees, knees over feet stance before I started this movement and, and pushed them back, okay? Uh, this cat here, very efficient player, probably a four, seven guy. And I'm going to talk about him multiple times in this, uh, a, a great college player who, when his college career was done, became a, a flag football player at the local park. This guy right here converted offensive player that played in the national football league for about three, four five years. But at this point in his career, transitioning from offense, he's learning the defensive fundamentals. So as we look at these two, you see the guy up top, okay, leading with his butt. He's using his arms. His numbers are over his knees. His knees are over his feet. He's got a nice controlled back pedal from the knees down, okay? The guy nearest us, his chest is, 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 is forward. His steps aren't going back very far, and he's about ready to get his weight back on his heels and roll himself over. So components of the back pedal that I want to emphasize that you can watch as we go throughout. First thing is, I want the kids to lead with their butt, okay? To help emphasize that, I'll stand behind them, put my hands on their waist, indicate like there's a lasso wrapped around them right there, and then I will pull them back so they can feel the butt roll back and understand what it feels like to lead with the butt not your shoulder blades, okay? We pedal from the knee down. So lead with the butt, pedal from the knee down. I want arm movement. There's multiple ways you can do that. You can pound nails with your hand. You can drive the elbows back just like you would when you're running forward. And lastly, we wanna scrape the grass right off, but I wanna reach back and gain ground as I'm doing that. Okay, so control phase, they're just nice and easy pedaling, and they're reading whether it's run or pass at this point. All right, coming back, okay? Focusing on me as the coach, you can see two movements. The first one is getting them started with control. Then the second hand gesture is getting them into the speed pedal. They, they need to understand what they're seeing with their eyes during this. The quarterback is taking the ball. There's no handoff that's taking place, and his eyes are looking down the field. So I got a drop back pass, and that's what they're transitioning in. The, the primary thing that I'm looking for as they increase their speed is the, the pad level doesn't rise, okay? I don't want the pads to go up. I don't want them to go down when they enter this speed phase. The pad level should stay the same as a transition from control to speed right there. Next phase, okay, we'll go back to the efficiency of these two players. They're control their speed and right there, okay, they're transitioning into a zone turn. 
Their cushion has been ate up, and there's a threat. This receiver's about ready to run by them, so we want to get into a zone turn. First thing I'll point out is their eyes are where they need to be. The receiver is still in front of them. So as we open up the hips, I don't want my eyes rolling this way. The game is still up here. The second thing I will point out, okay, is when they get in this position where the foot is crossed over, I want to see that hip bone right there. I don't want to see the crack of their ass. I don't want their hips all the way rolled open because as soon as he gets my hips open, that's when the curl, that's when the comeback, that's when the dig are going to get executed, okay? Not necessarily on time at a yardage level, but when they get my hips to roll open. So hips, uh, hip bone on, on the line of scrimmage on the receiver, eyes still forward. I'll go back and we'll look at the efficiency of these two. They're, they're pedaling at the same location. But as they open, you see the young man up top get his foot all the way open, okay, where the player nearest us, okay, takes that step where he gets it set right there. And, he, and he's forced to do what I call a skip. Right there, you can see that little skip. And the efficiency of the young man up top extends him by a full yard. We all know that's a big difference when it comes to coverage and what you're trying to get accomplished. So I want to emphasize the importance of efficiency in what you're teaching and what you're getting out of your kids because in reality, these are the two athletes that we're dealing with right there. And at this point in their career, the guy up top, who's three-tenths slower, was a much more efficient defensive back. The last phase then is to zone turn and turn and run. And you can see the head go from looking at the receiver to his cushion getting ate up the rest of the way, and now he's got to turn and run. Here's how I've changed this drill from the 2000s to where we are now. Once the eyes went this way, and as you remember me saying, we covered the man, now I want to play the ball. So I'll have them run for a few steps with their eyes here, then I'll have them get their eyes back as they continue to run, but get their eyes back to the quarterback and be able to locate the ball, find the ball, and play the ball. Once we get a guy covered, I, I emphatically teach to locate the ball and play the ball because if you're going to get a break from, from the official, you better have your eyes back in that position to do that. All right, so, so, some, some looks at it, okay? This, this is up top, okay? Right here is where we're looking. Control phase into a speed phase. You can see it. You can see the rapidness of, of the arm movement and the feet movement as he gains more ground. He's got an excellent pedal here. You can see the pump of the arms. You can see the butt leading away. You can see the pedal from the knees down. You can see him scraping the top of the grass right off, yet taking big steps to gain ground. His cushion gets broke. He gets his hips open. His eyes are still on the receiver, and his hip bone is back towards the line of scrimmage. Okay, and then he's able to utilize what I call his tool right there and slow the receiver down as his eyes come back to locate the ball and play the ball. This is a, a great, great picture of taking a backpedal progression to the field and what I call off-man coverage. Coverage we'd, we'd use in, in zero coverage, playing man. Coverage we'd use in quarters coverage. Progression coverage when I'm responsible for the man in my zone uh, in, in a man type of way. It's a, it's a good look at it. If, if I can't, if we all can't take this bit of film and show what just took place and, and show the, the phases of the back pedal and the drills that took place within it, then, then you're wasting your kid's time in the work that you're getting done and, and you're not gaining the credibility, in my opinion, that you need uh, to be an effective coach. So continue to point out drills in the in the snaps the positive snaps that are taking place on the field just another look at it
Moving on. Okay, too far. Uh, I'm going to move past this drill uh, just because of, of time and, and move on to the next one. This is just a hot drill. We, we played enough off coverage, and, and uh, most people do, that you're going to get a hot pass, three-step game, quick game, and, and want to be able to react to it, so you better drill it if, if you're going to get what you want out of it. Okay, partner weave drill. I, 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 I've done it. I, I, I've, I've done a lot of it where I took that DB and, and pedaled him here and pedaled him here and pedaled him here and did that with a ball in my hand or did that by swinging my arms and so forth. Um, I, I, I realized I, I, wasn't, I wasn't getting it done efficiently. I wasn't getting it done how it was needed to be done on the field. So any, any weave type of work I did, I started doing with the receiver that created it. There's two types of, of, of leverages that I got to maintain. I got to maintain a vertical leverage, so I got to work my pedal, and I got to work a horizontal leverage so the receiver doesn't get away from me. So the purpose of this drill is to maintain those two leverages. The receiver's got to work with you. He's got to make this guy move. And, and we, we'll, we'll get some of that out of these, and I'll work till I, I get it. So the receiver right there, he's coming off the numbers and he's starting to work to the inside. And that DB right there, you can see it. He pushes off the left foot and he starts to work inside. So he's maintaining the inside leverage that he started with, but he's doing it off of body, not off of a ball or, or hand reaction. At the same time, this receiver is pushing him up the field. So he's got to work that back pedal harder until now. And his cushion gets broke and he ends up in a good position up the field. We'll, we'll work somebody here that gets a little bit more movement. This particular DB has chose to start with outside leverage. The receiver makes a hard cut away, and he makes a decision that I can't work my pedal. He's getting away from me too quick, and I can't weave my pedal and stay in the relationship I need, so I got to get my hips open and run to close and maintain that leverage. So they win. They learn when they can do one and when they have to do the other. Okay, this receiver does a nice job of pushing even harder to the inside. The DB's working that pedal hard. Okay, the receiver squares back up on him. He squares back up his pedal. Cushing gets broke. And then he's got to execute a center field turn to maintain both that vertical and horizontal leverage that we talked about. To do this, I, I work the guys down with the field one way and then bring the other guy back this way so we get, we get reps in an expeditious manner. Look at this. Hey, right here, right here is where we're looking. I think we've got a better view from the, from the inside. So there you can see number four. Receiver stemming him to the inside. He pushes off the left foot hard, maintains the inside leverage. Then when the route is broken off and he can't work the pedal anymore, he puts a foot in the ground and he comes down and he's right there on the upfield shoulder. I'll find it here. Okay, receiver here and DB on the hash. He starting with inside leverage, gets himself open too soon, especially with the athlete that's coming at him. Then the receiver works back inside because his hips are open. He can't pedal this. We don't want to open to the, the receiver. It's going to take too much time. So he executes that center field turn that you just saw in the drill and ends up in a good upfield shoulder leverage position. All right, keep, keep moving on here to give you some, some more drills. All right, how, how we change direction. How I change direction with the guys is, is defensive backs, okay? W drill, I'll get right to the film and, and, and coach off of it. All right, I do it in the form of, of three cones. Cone here, cone here. Cone here, okay? Here's what we're operating off of. Again, I used to work with my hands and a ball in the hands and all that, uh, but I want them operating 
off of a receiver. So their eyes are on this guy. They're seeing him run his route, and then they're seeing him stutter and cut his route. And that's when they are changing direction. So to get multiple breaks in this drill, the first one will work a speed pedal, okay, and will drive. The second one will start in a speed pedal, they'll zone turn on their own, and then they'll drive and they'll finish through this cone. We can finish here with a tackle on an agile, we can do a scoop and score, I can throw them a ball so I can get multiple two pieces to this drill. To, to get, that's all, that's all driving forward with my, with my eyes and my chest. I can put the coach down here running and work their chest open this direction and then work speed turns to come back. So any type of, of change of direction drill that we want to work in this W3 cones in a 10 yard space, we can do. And there should be a little distance in between these two because you're going to come out quicker from a square pedal than you were from a zone turn operation. When they change direction, okay, I want it to be bam, bam. I want them to put their, their brake foot in the ground, bam, right there. And then I want the drive foot coming forward, and I want to eat up that distance from where I brake to that cone. I don't want them putting on the brakes early. I want them getting hard into that cone before they settle down in a stance and wait for the movement of the coach to start to run again. So let's just look at this player here. I'll coach the inefficiency piece in the purple jersey. You can see where his foot's gone, okay? Whenever we break, I talk about the cylinder. The cylinder is this right here. And when we break, I want that foot in that cylinder. When the foot gets out here, it gets slanted. I can't bend like a shock absorber, and I get on the edge of my shoe, and now I'm playing on a sheet of ice instead of utilizing all the cleats that are in the bottom of that shoe. Multiple ways coming back and forth, okay? So now we're looking up here. He's gonna work his back pedal progression, and then he's gonna roll right into a W drill, just like you saw number four when we were working the, the, the partner weave. He's control pedal. Okay, never gets out of it, sees a receiver break, break foot, drive foot in the ground, and drive in the upfield shoulder. Okay, making a play and, and getting, getting a ball punched out of there. Okay, both corners. This one, this one out of a, a staying in the speed pedal. Nope, nope, first one was speed pedal, this one is his own turn. So this is the second break. In the W drill, they both got their hips open, which is the same position they got into on the second break in that W drill. Now they're putting their foot in the ground and coming back and eating up that receiver. Uh, again, I can't, I can't emphasize enough. Uh, the, the more you can show drills on the field, the, the more credibility you, you have with the, with the kids. Jim, are you on there with me? Yeah, we're good, Coach. Would, would you rather I, I, I keep going at this point or, or, or stop and see if we have any questions? Well, let me, uh, let me, let me check the chat. I think the chat, there's only, there's only one question right now. Um, I'll let you know in a minute. I want you to keep going, and then, uh, yeah, and then we'll get some no questions problem. later. Perfect. Okay. The, the W drill men, I do that on, on two work days of the week, and then I, I, I do this box drill – the other day, coaching linebackers, I do this box drill with them also. So let me set it up for you, okay? We got four cones. Basically, it's a 10 by 10 box. It's, it's truly a 10 by nine box because I set the top cones at the top of the numbers, which are nine yards from the sideline. I'm going to give them a ready, ready, and then I'm going to say feet. They're going to fire their feet. The first movement, they're going to they're gonna pedal. From there, I'm going to point to one of the four cones. They are always going to open up their chest to me as they work to the cone. They're always going to keep their eyes on me as they work in their direction. We're not trying to get to the cone. We're just trying to run 
in the direction that we're pointing as fast as we possibly can until I point to another cone. Then we're going to open up the hips and the chest, and we're going to keep the eyes on, on the coach and run as fast as we can in the other direction. Okay, pedal, I point forward, bam. Okay, there's a W drill like break, a change of direction forward, and they're running as fast as they can, not anticipating when the next turn is going to come. Okay, there it goes, bam. You can see eyes, eyes on me and chest to me as they run in that direction. Okay, now it's to their back right, foot goes in the ground, elbows throw open, hips get open and they're running fast in that direction before we change them again. Okay, at that point one got tired, okay, you can see him rise up. It's, it's a little bit of an ass kicker drill and, and they're gonna get a good burn in it. I usually do it twice. Uh, the first time I hold them longer, the second time I hold them short and we're coming out here on this particular day, we're, we're working a ball drill in, in the middle of it. Same drill, di different look. All right. Uh, um, I, I'm going to get a lot more detailed here uh, um, with, with, with man, and, and that's going to carry me past. So I'm, I'm just going to swing back. And, and uh, let, let's, let's get that one question, Jim, and, and maybe that'll uh, produce some more as we get started. Okay, Coach, let me see. Uh... When do you like your DBs to look back for the ball in phase? Yep. Yeah, and, and, and I, I failed to, to, to finish that thought as I was in, well, that's my dang, uh, uh, screen cut out on me. So uh, uh, cover the man, play the ball. Cover the man, play the ball. And the first, when, when they hear that, at, at, at our level, uh, your level, et cetera, when they hear that, they feel like they need to get shoulder to shoulder on that receiver or be hip to hip to have him covered before they then look, look for the ball and give themselves an opportunity to play the ball. That's, that's not true. When, when, when the timing to look back is, if, if, I'm, if I'm five yards off a receiver, let's say, and, and he makes a, a post cut and I cut with him, and my aim goes right where it needs to be. I'm, I'm working to his upfield shoulder position. He's run his route. I've made my break. I'm in the right angle to cover the route. That's when you want him to look back for the ball. But they don't need to get to, to the receiver. Once the receiver's made his cut, and I've matched that cut, and I'm on the right path to, to go into where he's going, that's when we coach him to look for the football. Good, 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 good. Thanks, Coach. Let's see, we got another one. Uh, coach Sanders, Brandon Sanders, how you doing, sir? Hey, uh, uh, Coach Sanders has a question. What brakes do you prefer, T-step or bicycle? <laughs> um, I, call it, I call it a V-step, but, uh, but I, I, I re I'll refer to it as, as both and, and, and certainly in, in clinic talks. Uh, um, let, let, let me, I don't know how much, not really, uh, um, trying to stand up and, 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 and demonstrate where you can see me. The, the, the full T-step, I'll move a little bit to one, here T-step, and I get that, that toe where it's pointing towards the sideline, and this toe where it's pointing towards the line of scrimmage, okay? I really, really stress that hip flexor. So, so I don't want to get that far with it. So when we were talking about that gizzard drill and, and countering the problems that the DBs have with that, we talk in terms of a V-step. So if, if this is my hand and my, my toes here towards the line of the scrimmage, I want that other foot to be like this, okay? I want it in the ground, and I want all the cleats on that shoe in the ground with it. If I get it here, too much stress on the hip. So I want it to be a V-step 
but it is break foot and dry foot and we're gone from, from where we are at. Um, I don't know if you caught my, my, my giggle. Uh, um, I, I can't stand the, the, the bicycle uh, uh, brake and, and bicycle change, change of direction. I, I don't understand the philosophy behind running in place and, and, and not going anywhere. And I, I don't mean anything disrespectful. I, I just don't. And if, if, if I take two, two DBs and put them side by side, and I got 10 bicycle guys and I got 10 uh, uh, V-step brake guys. The V-step brake guys are gonna win nine out of 10 times. And, and I, I can say that with confidence because I've tested it. W one guy is really, really, really efficient at it because he's a really, really good player. And he's quicker out of his bicycle brake than this guy is out of a bam, bam, uh, uh, V-step brake coming out of his uh, uh, change of direction. So. Uh, em emphatically, uh, a V-step uh, brake change of direction over over a bicycle brake. All right, sounds good. Uh, let me see what we got. Uh, how's another one? Would you rather prefer your DB staying in his back pedal longer than opening the gate? V very much so. I'm going to play everything in front of me more efficiently from a square position. If, if you remember uh, um, going back to the W drill, when we watched, when, when we got two guys out there at the same time, the, 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 the rare reps where you saw where they both ended up at the same location when the coach broke his route off, the guy that was already in his zone turn ended up a little bit behind the guy who was square still main, maintaining his back pedal. In, in the last few years, I've, I've softened my stance on, on the speed pedal in, in, in allowing too much cushion, in allowing too much to occur in, in, in front of me and at the intermediate level. So I've, I've actually decreased the amount of speed pedal that we utilize to, to put ourselves in closer proximity and better shape to drive on a curl or drive on a dig and open it at the last second to go with the vertical route as opposed to trying to work that speed pedal all the way back 20 yards from the line of scrimmage and, and, and giving up uh, curls and throws in front of us that, that we don't have a window player, an underneath zone player to help us on. All right, coach. That's a that's a, a lot of information. Good information. I uh, appreciate you coming on. I mean, uh, you know, you guys have you particular, Coach Rhodes. You've been there for us since day one, and uh, I remember uh, you were generous with your time. We went out. You were with your other your last stop, and and uh, always appreciate that. Always ready to talk ball with us, and uh, it's been it's been a pleasure uh, spending some time with you. Appreciate you coming on today. I know a lot of these guys got a lot of stuff out of it. So uh, I know everybody's busy and, and uh, appreciate you and what you guys are doing down in Tucson is awesome. Th thank you, Jim. And, and, and thank you, man. Thank what you do for these young people. Um, we, we all know, uh, you know what they do have and what they don't have in, in their lives. And the fact that you guys are in their lives, especially with the quarantine and, and some of the idle time that they have on their hands and, and giving them direction. I, obviously, we're talking to them because we're recruiting them and, and we know what you're doing with them. And the fact that they're getting that guidance and that leadership and that mentorship from you is, is so important to their lives. This, is, this has been a crazy year where, where you haven't been able to get down to Tucson uh, to visit us, but I want you to know our doors are open in the future. Uh, not going to happen this fall, I would suspect, as we both get back to work, but please, in the off season, in the winter and the spring, uh, please reach out and don't hesitate to come down to Tucson and, and, and spend some time with us here at the University of Arizona. Will do, Coach. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure a lot of guys want to take you up on it. Appreciate your time, Coach. Again, thank you very much for coming on and talking ball with us. You got it. Have a great day. Thank you.